my glasses here. Welcome. Um, for those of you whom I haven't yet had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Lisa Florman, and I'm chair of the History of Art Department here at Ohio State. It's my distinct honor this evening to welcome you to the Wexner Center for the Arts for this 2019 Hammond Lecture on the American Tradition. In some sense, our speaker, Kelly Jones, needs little introduction, but I would be remiss not to cover at least the highlights. Professor Jones holds faculty appointments in both the departments of art history and archeology span and the newly minted African American and African Diaspora Studies Department at Columbia University. The recipient of numerous grants and awards, including for example, a Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant, a year of scholar in residence at the Terra Foundation for American Art in Giverny, France, and as of Saturday, membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She also, and perhaps most importantly, was awarded one of the aptly dubbed Genius Grants from the MacArthur Foundation, which she received in 2016. That award followed on the heels of two absolutely transformative exhibitions that Professor Jones curated. Now Dig This, Art in Black Los Angeles, 1960 to 1980, held at UCLA's Hammer Museum, and Witness, Art and Civil Rights in the 1960s at the Brooklyn Museum. Both were named among the best exhibitions of their respective years by Art Forum. Now Dig This was also judged the best thematic show of the year by the International Association of Art Critics. Professor Jones is, of course, not only a curator, but also a writer. Her publications include I Minded, Living and Writing Contemporary Art, published by Duke University Press in 2011, and South of Pico, African American Artists in Los Angeles in the 1960s and 1970s, also from Duke and released in 2017. South of Pico was named one of the best books of the year by both the New York Times and Art Forum. It also received the Walter and Lillian Lowenfels Criticism Award at the American Book Awards in 2018. Both of these texts, I should mention, are available from the Wexner Center Bookstore, and Kelly has already signed uh, the copies that they have, so I urge you to stop in there on your way out. Through her exhibitions and publications, Kelly Jones has significantly expanded and enriched the canon of American art, bringing greater attention to a whole host of underknown and underappreciated artists principally African-American, Latinx, and Latin American artists, as well as artists of the African diaspora. Today's talk will focus on the work of three women, the sculptor Elizabeth Catlett and painters Elizabeth Murray and Candida Alvarez, specifically as a means of raising the question, what if the history of art were taught as a history of female artists? One suspects it would be very different from the art history we currently possess, and an even further cry, from the one that those of us who graduated college in the early 1980s were taught in our courses. By all rights, then, we ought to rename the title of this lecture series, pluralizing it. It should be the William Hammond Lectures on American Traditions. And so it will be, at least for tonight's talk, Women in the Dream Work. Please join me in warmly welcoming this fall's Hammond Lecture, Professor Kelly Jones. That was such a great um, introduction, and one day I'm going to be able to do those great introductions myself. So thank, thank you all, um, hope this is not too echoey, uh, for coming uh, today to hear this lecture, and I just want to start by thinking about today as Indigenous Peoples Day, and uh, being in the land of uh, speakers of the Algonquin and Iroquois languages. Many, many, many uh, people who started uh, here in this land. So I just uh, wanted to recognize that on today. And I also um, want to dedicate this lecture, as I always do, that was my tradition from graduate school, and I've kept doing it, to some great friends that are here uh, Deidre Stevens and her husband Ron, who I've known for quite some time, her sister Jocelyn, she's even in the audience, and also to the Circlets, who I met yesterday. 
And um, so I'm glad to meet them. And I want to think about the circle being unbroken, which is a hymn from the early 20th century uh, that thinks about our connections. So I want to think about that in relation to the circlets and all the people that I've just mentioned. So thank you. So um, this lecture started, in a way, for me thinking about the, you know, we always talk about the work in progress, <clears throat> but I really want to think about, I flipped it to think about the progress of work. How do we go get to the next project? And uh, for me, these three women were projects that I had worked on, and, and I found that there were connections to them that one, in, in some ways, led to the next. Um, and it was also, um, I also thought about it in relationship to ideas of the Me Too movement, um, Time's Up, Decolonize, This Place, uh, the ideas of you know, success, uh, delayed success for women, and um, also women whose success is delayed, but then it's renewed in their 80s. Somebody like Betty Saar, who right now uh, is opening a big show at the Museum of Modern Art and also has a project at LACMA. And she's in her 90s, you know? She had her first show in Europe in her 90s, you know? So this is uh, what we think about when, you know, when we're talking about looking at the work of women artists. I was also inspired by my students of a certain generation. There was a cohort of graduate students in art history who came into our program at Columbia and said they made a pact with each other that they would do their dissertations on women um, because it would change the discourse down the road. And so that was also very inspiring to me, you know, to, to begin thinking about if we, if we taught an art survey only about women, because as you know, it's usually only about men, and you have to actually make a, you know, an effort to like, ooh, let's include some women, and to say nothing of, you know, if we're talking about diversifying in other ways. So um, that, all those things were in my mind when, when I started on this project. Or these linked projects, and, um, so I kind of go chronologically through these different women and talk about how they're linked as well. Elizabeth Catlett was uh, born in 1915, died in 2012. She was born in Washington, D.C. Uh, she worked in sculpture and prints, as I'll talk about. And um, I worked on uh, part of this essay for the catalog for we Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965 to 1985, which was at the Brooklyn Museum in, in, in 2017. And, um, you know, even though I'm telling you Elizabeth Catlett was born in 1915, but as you'll see in the talk, she actually came, became very important in the 60s. She has had a BFA from Howard University, and she actually got the very first MFA in art, hist in art in this country um, from the University of Iowa in 1940. Very first MFA ever given in this country. So all of you who are artists, okay, Elizabeth Catlett, thank you. Um, uh, as you'll see from the lecture, there were some issues with her being there, but uh, they dedicated a building in her name in, in 2017 um, there at University of Iowa. Um, Elizabeth Murray, uh, born in 1940, uh, died in 2007. She was born in Chicago. She had a BFA from the Art Institute of Chicago and an MFA from Mills College in Oakland, working in paintings and prints. And this project was one that I worked on in 2017 for the Pace Gallery, uh, thinking about the impact of her work in the 1980s. Uh, she was an art star, but only had a major museum solo at the Museum of Modern Art, and maybe it was only the second one dedicated to a woman in 2005, right before her untimely death. Um, and we think about this era in her work, uh, this idea of a return to painting in the 80s after you know, conceptualism, 
uh, was uh, abounded in the 1970s and also a return to narrative. And she was also a mentor to uh, many younger women artists and cultural workers, including myself. And um, finally, Candida Alvarez, who was born in 1955, uh, born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, received a BA from Fordham University and an MFA from Yale University. Uh, she started her career in the 1980s and was mentored by Elizabeth Murray. Um, and her very first monograph, to continue our theme, is about to come out any minute. And of course, her image uh, there all the way on your left was part of the poster for this talk. Um, and she's in her 60s, right? So she's getting her first monograph. Um, and inspired, you know, asked to work on her, uh, an essay on her for that monograph, um, but also inspired by the Latinx stories on view in a show that was also touring called Radical Women Latin American Art, 1960 to 1985, which was um, very uh, just wide ranging and again brings a whole lot of ideas and uh, brings into being a whole lot of new scholarship when you get to see work that you don't know about and see how it connects to work you do know about. In a testament to the power of women and to the tenacity and focus required to, uh-oh, now I'm, I'm losing my vision here, so let me turn on this light. Ah, there it is. Ah, thank you. Uh, in a testament to the power of women and to the tenacity and focus required to will a creative career into existence, in the year between 1946 and 47, Elizabeth Catlett accomplished the following after less than a year in Mexico. She returned to her hometown of Washington, D.C. and got a divorce, married for a second time to a feminist, Francisco Mora, eight years her junior, gave birth to her first child, had a solo show at Washington, D.C.'s Barnett Aiden Gallery, and returned to Mexico City. For much of the next decade, while her children were young, she focused on printmaking. Like Betty Saar, another American artist known for her sculpture, Catlett found the print medium more user-friendly with babies underfoot. She also worked collectively, finding, finding support in the renowned Taller de Grafica Popular, TGP, or Popular or People's Graphic Workshop. From its founding in the 30s, like Mexico's better known mural movement, TGP had as its goal making art available to the country's citizens. As part of the nation's institutional revolution, TGP created things that supported people's lives such as posters for literacy and flyers for workers. The workshop attracted people from all over the world who came to participate and study, including Catlett in 1946. She found facilities to work and thrive with the sustenance of the collective, its weekly meetings, critiques, shared projects, and mission. Through TGP, she learned the importance of political content joined with form. She discovered that she wanted to direct her art towards the main mass of people. Catlett returned to sculpture when her youngest son entered kindergarten in the 50s. Her themes remain remarkably consistent over time. Celebrations of women, their power, their politics, their bodies, the bond with their children. Rarely working from models, she employed a technique learned from art educator Victor Lowenfeld while she was in residence at Hampton University in the early 40s. It involved imagining structure from inside her own body. How did this movement pose or angle feel from the interiors of her own being? And having written this, you know, done some future research, which I'll, I'll talk about at the end, part of imagining something from inside your own body is why? Because Black artists didn't usually have access to the model. Because if you were going to an art school like, for instance, Columbia University, you could go to Teachers College, and as an artist, you had access to a model. Um, but if you were a black person and the model was white and nude and a woman, no. 
So part of this whole thematic of learning to envision the model from inside your own body is because you don't have access to this as a person in segregation. A scholar Tina Camp dis uh, Camp's discussion of the haptic nature of photographic practice can be easily applied to Catholic's working method. A constellation of ideas relating to the sense of touch constitute the haptic. Through, the physical, through physical touch, we understand the tactility of things. With indexical touch, we absorb the contextual framing of the black female body as sign, an effective touch being how an object stirs us emotionally. In Camp's view, the haptic also signals our own modes of perception, how we as viewers connect to an object. What are our responses to the encounter with Catlett's sculpture? Catlett's own sense of the haptic also comes from within. As a champion swimmer and lifeguard, she would have had intricate knowledge of human movement and power, feeling for the body in space, its mass, its weight, and weightlessness in water which could be translated into sculpture. Catlett's sculpture from the 50s and 60s is replete with elegant, vibrant figures. Consider her bronze figure of 1961 or her seated woman of 1962 and Mujer of 64, and the last two are in mahogany and you can see them on the screen. All signal the embodiment of women with ample hips and bosoms along with Catlett's signature spiraling and draped skirt that emphasizes the lower regions but also gives the figure a gracious femininity. Clothing here is mere suggestion, allowing her to focus on the contours of the body without creating a nude. For, given the vulnerability and exploitation of black bodies throughout world history, nakedness continued to be a conflicted subject in the art of African Americans. As art historian Melanie Ann Herzog suggests, the artist offered nothing less than a pioneering reclamation of bodies and beings that were black and female. Critic Michael Brenson describes Catlett's figures as modestly dressed and as such unmarked by covet covetousness, envy, anger, gluttony, or any of the other seven deadly sins they have clearly encountered in the world around them. Such imaginative properties of the sculpture find continuity in formal ones for Brenson, in which Catlett's sculptural surfaces seek and are touched and tended by light and exquisitely maneuver the play of positive and negative space. Other sculpture remain the uh, remain, reimagine the classically Western, overwhelmingly biblical, but also truly global theme of a mother with her offspring. Two examples evince Catlett's explorations and range. Mother and Child, uh, 56, in terracotta, turns on rounded, organic forms and naturalistic rendering. A later Mother and Child of 59, hewn from mahogany, is angular and abstracted, gleaming with the polished surface that would continue to mark the artist's works in wood. However, we should Remember that the centering of the female form being an intellect went back to the very beginning of Catlett's oeuvre. We see it in Pensive of 46, a woman in bronze hugging her body and communing with her thoughts, her blouse a sheer layer revealing the feminine form, whose sleeves provide a spiraling pattern that the artist would eventually apply to womanly hips, bringing it to life as a skirt. And it was her earliest mother and child, 1940, that won Catlett the first prize in sculpture at Chicago's American Negro Exposition that same year. Already we see Catlett's draped skirt on view. And sorry for this awful slide on the left. <laughs> While imagining a body that bespeaks African American history and heritage, the artist also thought about the people of her adopted home in Mexico. They appear in both her own prints and those created with the collective TGP and show up in sculpture, too. If pieces such as Figure, 1961, Seated Woman, 62, and Mujer, 64, refer to a black female body, others such as Reboso, 57, and the bus Reboso, 68, both in limestone and on the screen, developed an iconic Mexican and perhaps more specifically indigenous 
feminine profile. These appear slightly more abstract than her other figures, with the shawl-like Graboso enveloping rather than emphasizing bodily curves. Draping, though, continues to play a significant role. Catlett's practice can be seen as a feminist intervention, inspired in part by several years spent in New York City prior to moving to Mexico. Scholars have unpacked the discourse of black left feminism developing from the 20s through the 50s in the US. Nurtured in part in Communist Party USA and popular front circles, it was a standpoint that placed working class black women at the center of social struggle in ways that spoke to the nexus of race, class, gender, and ultimately transnational discourse. Advanced by activists and writers like Esther Cooper Jackson, Marvel Cook, and Claudia Jones. In the 1950s, publicly and unceasingly harassed by McCarthyism, numerous progressive women used a strategy of familialism, which relied on more staid notions of family than many of these radical women had heretofore practiced, according to historian Eric uh, McDuffie. Tina Camp might say it was a performance of family which mobilized a sign of maternal touch. In this political context, we see how Catlett's signaling to the family through repeated images of the mother and child might conform to such logic while continuing to press a feminist agenda. Catlett returned to the US only once per decade during this period, visiting in 54 and again in 61. Her commitment to raising three small children, the financial and other burdens of international travel, and eventually her responsibilities as a professor and chair of sculpture at the Escuela Nacional de Artes Plásticas in the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México made such trips an understandable challenge. But there was also Cold War politics. McCarthyism reached across the border into Mexico, where the government took a more conservative turn. Catlett was harassed by US authorities during the 50s. This tense situation built to a terrifying pitch in 1959, when one night, a home alone with her children, she was spirited away to jail as a foreign agitator. Given this state of affairs, Catlett eventually became a Mexican citizen in 1962. However, she was then prevented from returning to the US for a decade, labeled an undesirable alien in the country of her birth. In Mexico, Catlett had her first solo show in 1962, a mix of sculpture and prints that would continue to characterize her one artist shows. Several years later, another exhibition featured more monumental works. Held at Mexico City's Museo de Arte Moderno in 1970, Experiencia Negra foregrounded a politicized black experience responding to the era of black power. Indeed, a list in the exhibition brochure confirms that a number of works that have shaped our understanding of Catlett's black activist oeuvre were first shown in Mexico. Prints such as the series at Negro es Bello, Black is Beautiful, um, from 68 to 69, which you see on the screen, along with sculptures such as Homage to My Young Black, si black Sisters of 1968, which were both actually made in Mexico. In the exhibition brochure, Catlett speaks of finding beauty in dirty, sucio materials, and always in search of forms that can best express an idea. These images offer a petition against black death, against yet another generation of African Americans in the 60s and 70s, becoming victims of inhumane repression, who are being killed for simply wanting to feed and educate their children. For Catlett, the display demonstrated a Mexican public contemporary Afri to a, to, for Catlett, the display demonstrated to a Mexican public contemporary African American life. She created what she understood as a total experience by having jazz played throughout the installation and attending the opening in African finery. Translated easily into English as black experience, the Spanish, ex Spanish exhibition title could be read as gendered. The word la experiencia uses a feminine declension requiring negra as opposed to negro, meaning black woman. 
Certainly, this was not lost on Catlett. Both the content and the emphasis of Experiencia Negra led to Catlett's many solo shows in the US in the first half of the 70s. She was finally allowed back into the land of her birth in 1971 in what art historian Richard J. Powell has called an artistic homecoming at New York's newly launched studio, studio museum in Harlem. Elizabeth Murray always suggested that her paintings were not simply domestic fictions, ones too easily ascribed to women and their sphere, and as such written off. Indeed, her pieces are part of the history of Western still life painting. She absorbed the modern experiments of her heroes, Juan Gris and Paul Cezanne, their off-kilter movement into pic inside pictorial space, their thoughts about shifting and multiple viewpoints, but still life also has roots in 17th century Spanish bodegones, sparse and frugal in many ways. The predominant color palette Murray uses in the 80s reflects similar earthy tones and subdued interiors full of quiet drama. Dutch still life, also from the 17th century, is perhaps more renowned. These are paintings commissioned by an emergent mercantile culture where luxury and abundance are tangible signs of success. While the saturation and sheen of oil-based pigment has been discussed in some quarters as being invented to describe flesh, art historian Krista Thompson's 21st century take on things gets us closer, I think, to what Murray is after. Hers are paintings where, after all, few figures appear, and when they do, are schematic versions of themselves. In Dutch canvases, Thompson sees instead that commodities have the greatest glow, having contributed to their patron's success. These things pose and shine and bling. If bodies do, they are human captives that also bring a pretty penny in the marketplace. The plenitude of the 1980s moves through Murray's canvases in rowdy and oversized flying forms that spin and hurl themselves through a pictorial space, eventually bursting into three dimensions. Just in Time and Wake Up, both of 81, are some of Murray's early successes with getting a picture inside of a shape. Expanses of color, opaque and lustrous, describe each item whose crisp painterly surfaces begin to come undone at their perimeters, dripping and fraying, revealing seemingly unending strata. Exuberant chroma in just in time settles on a vessel that will prove to be a bit more static than those that come later, although it pries itself into two distinct halves. The wall in between is a line that emphasizes and fondles the beauty of each side's shape. Its goofy cotton candy froth is a nod to the cartoony sources that Murray, pop artists, and others giddily embraced as a sign of trivial Americana and of home. Breaking into a third piece, Wake Up emphasizes the zigs and zags of the empty spaces formed between the sections. Shifting blues are oceanic, dynamic waves of liquid sloshing over the cup's rim. A saucer in three parts is filmic, animated. The orange, red, and pink underpainting here reminds us of the importance of oil paint as medium to Murray's and others' experiments in the 80s. Its suppleness, flexibility, the ease of change, moving things around a picture, multiple coatings of surfaces who opac whose opacity still wants to reveal, and the relationship to drawing quite different from the more contemporary acrylic. The scenes in Murray's paintings are nevertheless domestic. Though at some points barely recognizable or perceptible, the cups, tables, saucers, chairs, rooms seem painted from the point of view of users who know them, love them, use them. They are rarely at rest but in almost perpetual motion. They encounter everyday calamities, spilling, tumbling, overturning, slipping, swirling, stirring, or perhaps generally turning up, as one might say today. 
Murray's art here thinks about the minor accidents that happen in daily life, things banal and domestic and sometimes even corny. We might compare Murray's canvases to O'Keeffe's floral studies, their relationship both to ideas of what was modern as well as the place of women in it. Anne Wagner has considered such a woman's fear in O'Keeffe's work as a shelter for a modernist protocol and its simultaneous destabilization without too much opposition. In the 1920s, the artist proposed to viewers the known so they would ignore the hallucination. We find a similar dissonance in Murray's table-turning perspective and use of provocative, shrill hues. What distinguishes Murray in the 1980s is that the control of uncontrol is not contained simply in the pictorial narrative, but is taken up in every possible manner. She remakes the category of painting, retooling ideas of surface, shape, and structure, reconsidering its life as object, what it can be. Images and planes evolve, they are to be puzzled through. However, as critic Joan Simon noted, the more overtly three-dimensional the works have become, the more forcefully Murray has exerted her painterly strategies to counter their sculptural presence. Murray's art has been discussed in terms of still life painting from the Baroque to the modern. Though the majority of such compositions seem to appear in settings quite neutral and amorphous, the better to focus on the goods themselves, we know such narratives are related to the kitchen and the living room. Another interesting comparison might be the oeuvre of Mary Cassatt, particularly in her works on paper in dry point and aqua tint around 1890, we also get skewed sight lines, eccentric interiors with things at odd angles. The bath, the living room, afternoon tea, and more daringly, the theater loge are the places repeated in these pieces, spaces inhabited and used by women and women of the artist's class. Their unexpected color and compositional structure revealed the influence of Japani Japanese yukioi prints on the Impressionists. As women artists were never, and are still rarely, integral to art history curricula, artists like Cassatt would go unmentioned by Murray and her generation. Such unbridled angles in Cassatt transform in Mary, Murray's pieces into domestic wares that careen around and out of such spaces on their own, and the canvases themselves are set in motion, ramping up to three dimensions, taking on architectural form, pushing at the edges of the painting sculptural divide. Among other women we might think about in relation to Murray are artists born somewhat earlier than she, such as Betty Saar and Elizabeth Catlett. Saar also moves between two and three dimensions, creating reliefs and assemblages that though they rely on found materials can be heavily reworked and painted, creating the illusion of a singular construct. These additive structures are juicy displays that confer plenitude on an object in ways similar to Murray's, fully worked surfaces and multiplying canvases in recombinant shapes and forms. Elizabeth Catlett explored wood, metal, and stone alike, but like Murray, pulled from a familiar thematic for the great majority of her pieces, in this case, the female figure. Part of her signature is a constant spiraling pattern equated by the artist with fabric seen early on on bronze shirt sleeves and later almost always appearing as a skirt, signaling both the amplitude and curves of the feminine as well as something always in motion, a connection we find to Murray's triangle as skirt as woman. And oh, I didn't ask about a pointer, but here we can see it, this kind of, uh, if we look at the top here, uh, which is kind of like a paintbrush, a body, kind of bun on the top of the head here on the yellow, which is also doubles as a paintbrush, 
uh, and then it's a body, and then this is a skirt which opens out. This is a foot, this is another foot. Although I, I understand that Elizabeth Murray, even though I knew her, I never, uh, I never really talked to her about her work in this way, so to have the opportunity to think about it, thank you so much. Um, button here, yeah, didn't ask about it, so you get it. Um, I, I understand that she didn't, even though she has all this stuff, which you can see, she didn't like people to really talk about it, like art historians to like, you know, reveal <laughs> what she was actually doing, right? But we can think about, you know, this is a skirt, this is a skirt, this is what she's think of, thinking about, and of course, if we're thinking about the idea of narrative coming back in, and, you know, some kind of, some kind of figures, more or less, um, sure, we can, we can make that um, connection. And also see it, even though, as we know, many women have had students who, writing on, you know, 70s and 60s and 70s, and they're like, these women were not feminists. They don't want to be feminists. Nobody wanted to be a feminist artist. Or not that they weren't feminists. They didn't want to be a feminist artist. I said, nobody wanted to be a feminist artist. What do you mean? That, it's like such a narrative that you can find over and over again, but it doesn't mean that some of these images are not there, or, or, or it doesn't mean that they weren't politically engaged in some way. So even though uh, Elizabeth Murray herself says, you know, hey, you know, I wasn't into feminist art, Judy Chicago, Miriam Shapiro, this kind of uh, group of artists, she still said, hey, I'm going to, you know, she still made work with skirts. <laughs> That's my point. Um, that, uh, you can see here. Of interest also is that Catlett, Saar, and Murray each spoke of their survival as women, mothers, and artists. They made choices of how and what kind of art to create in the swirl and everyday calamities of raising children. And I know I've had pushback, again, from students, which I love, about this thing, you know, well, oh, you're going to bring in children? Well, Guess what? Because we don't do it for men, so we shouldn't do it for women. Like, they talked about it, <laughs> so why not? And I think what's interesting here is that um, Murray made, um, if Catlett and Saar worked on Prince, and, when, and, and all of these women had three kids, okay? They didn't have one kid. They all had three kids, all right? And so Catlett and Saar, they did prints, and then when their kids got older, they moved into the sculptural. Murray was the complete opposite. She made some of her most complex work when she had babies under five. So I, I don't think there's a way that you can even talk about that as this is what women do. It's, it's different. And I also talk about it in ways where we can think about it uh, with Serena Williams. When I did a version of this talk, Serena Williams had just lost. And it was the one where she you know, was horrible, and they took away all those points. And, and at her um, press conference, she said, I don't have to cheat. She said, I love being on the court, and it is a problem-solving space for me. This is a creative problem-solving space. And for me to hear that I thought about these women having kids and you know, some feminists, oh, you can't have kids, it's going to take you away from your work. They saw it as a problem-solving space. So I thought that was also something interesting if we bring family into a narrative, right? What, what happens? It doesn't have to be the same narrative that we have, that we bring women into the canon, but we can't talk about their kids or we can't talk about families because we don't do it with men. Well, let's talk about something else. Um, the mutability of forms that Murray traffics in is emblematic of a generation of artists that carried painting and reinventing, reinvented abstraction in the 70s and 80s, including Carol Dunham, Mary Heilman, Bill Jensen, Joan Schneider, Pat Steer, Stanley Whitney, among others. Raphael Rubinstein refers to this as an androgyny of symbols and tones, which bespeaks artists affected in a multitude of ways by feminism. In interviews, Elizabeth Murray always returns to the fact that these works from the 80s are sexy. They are, for all intents and purposes, about the body, even though such fullness and corporeality are never really visible. 
1980, Murray married, met poet uh, Bob Holman, fell in love, and soon gave birth to two daughters. It was a fruitful time, and those are her words. The sexual nature of the images is also then invested in their fecundity. The increasing complexity of Murray's canvas components, compositional intricacy, and chromatic vitality bring painting back to a sensual realm and away from an aesthetic, aesthetic minimalism. As critic Nancy Grimes summed it up, quote, Murray heralded painting's desire to get wet again, to roll around in pigment, humor, narrative, and sex." End quote. Like others in this moment, she rejected the track of painterly purity. This was her feminist statement. While things soar and spill apart, they also come back together, opaque and translucent halves, pear and table turning. The imagined body of water girl and the bones and endoplasm of bean are each embraced by molotov kama, the onset of life. Triangles open in skirts of schematic female bodies in Not Goodbye and Her Story, both of 84, are vaginas of similarly comic valence. Then there are the myriad juicy teacups overflowing with unidentified liquids of all kinds, sloshing around in wake up, spilling out in flying by, and even discharging from tables into the cosmos of 96 tears. The possibility of the cup's gender for Murray is emphasized in her story with a triangular opening cut into a cup whose steam might also be a hairy pubis. To these assiduously rendered droplets, we can add the energetic canerly drips, which like Murray's boisterous brushwork, communicates an enthusiasm with painting itself. All right, so. Um, you can see her story here um, with the, I'm trying to find it with the cup here. And this kind of uh, thing cut into the cup that I was, well, here's the cup right here. Just mentioning how that works. And, and I'll get back to that at the end of, it's another thing that comes in with Candida Alvarez as well, who we will wrap up with. Working in and between mediums are always important for Candida Alvarez, but on the other hand, so was a certain specificity of subject matter. The protagonists of her childhood are places to remember and to start from, but they open onto larger universes. Lenny's hands and he loved to dream are thoughts on friends and family members. The latter painting, an homage to her father, Maxim Maximino Alvarez, who inspired her to pursue a creative life. The three panels of Sit, Stand, Kneel, of 86, correspond to the body's movement within the Catholic church service, showing several young girls obliging, and references the wide-ranging Catholicism among those of Latin American descent. Soy, I am Boricua, of 89, is a riveting diptych on wooden panels whose kaleidoscopic color nests a small portrait of a woman with a hand over her heart. The title moves easily between Spanish and English, never forgetting its New York roots, even to the, in the midst of the indigenous Taino word for the Puerto Rican people, which is Boricua, or the, the uh, yeah, Boricua is the people. <laughs> As scholar Francis Negron Montaner points out, language matters in Puerto Rican life. Spanish is recognized as a vernacular tongue and a point of community pride, yet at the same time, it references an imperial European tradition and signals certain language hierarchies, i.e. real Puerto Ricans speak real Spanish. The mixing of Spanish and English within Alvarez's work embraces a language hybridity that is the reality of contemporary Puerto Rico, a place no longer monolingual. The painting, its title, and the girl's pledging hand on her heart gestures to the politics of location embedded in Alvarez's work. How ideas of the translocal bubble up to the surface, what scholar Augustine Lau calls the geopolitical geosociety, geosocietal duality of Puerto Rico in which social space is shaped in between and across the island and mainland US 
outlining its awkward position as, in Lau's words, a colonial post-colony. Alvarez creates her own paths or systems of art making, in part by abstracting personal and human dynamics. She is also stimulated by the built environment. Yet such systems as artistic mediums are also inspired more generally by art practices of the late 20th century. Minimal and conceptual art processes of dematerialization, intermedia, postmedium, that are already imbricated in everyday interactions with images and communications. Coming of age in the 80s, Alvarez builds upon and moves outward from art's earlier conceptual turn. Like others of her generation, her practice becomes a generative or repetitive system as a way of redefining the work of art, the self, and the nature of representation. This is mapped in the ways that the artist's methods changed as the 80s evolved into the 90s, though the general attention to process and the root of inspiration come largely from the same cultural and conceptual places. The painted figure speaking, spinning into oblivion, into the painted figure spinning into formal and perceptual oblivion of She Went Round and Round, 84, for instance, becomes schematic in the next decade. One ex example of this is found in Extension of 1996, a mixed media drawing in pencil, wire, and nails on birch panel whose central star-like image mimics the girl's arms flung wide of the earlier and more traditional canvas. In the diptych Dame un Numero of 85, a woman requests our participation in her game, asking us for a number. Her beauty is mirrored in the subtle paint application and exquisite collaging of string and additional delicate canvas pieces. The warm palette as well as the intention behind a later wood panel diptych, Tossing Pennies, 1995, is similar. However, in the latter piece, the human agent is replaced by actual pennies, though the connection to the game remains. Mambo Diamond of 96, hung on its point, further uncovers the systems and schemas of Alvarez's work in that decade. Its internal cruciform pattern brings to mind a dance diagram suggested by the painting's title. Again, we can look back to an earlier piece and see the thread that links Mambo Diamond to Bolero of 84, in which a couple sway to the guitar-driven ballad of another Latin American song form. As Robert Ferris Thompson notes in some of his earliest writing, much of the music that moved around Latin America at mid-century started out in Cuba. Landing in 1960s New York, these sounds were popularized by Puerto Rican players like Eddie Palmieri and Johnny Pacheco. It was also music and dance with a West, with West African root, which contained a number of shared tropes, including call and response, multiple meter and percussive performance, and which were also invested with moral agency. Dance is another schema that ensnares the body and in this way can be conceived as part of ecological systems of living and caring described by systems theory. Abundant in New York in the same period as the emergence of conceptualism and minimalism, Latin music was a similar structuring sequence of art and life. A legion of scholars have found many ways to approach and imagine the intertextual in African diasporic aesthetics. Numerous writers have looked to water as a form of connection, from the specificity of the transatlantic to the capaciousness of the oceanic. Recently, anthropologist Vanessa Agar Jones has spoken of sand as both index and memory. To this, we can add Valerie D. Thomas's thoughts on the vertiginous, that dizzying sight at the crossroads of things. In the case of Alvarez, however, we can also parse this in things seen from on high by the impact of growing up in Brooklyn's high-rise housing projects. Living at such heights changed her notion of perception. Things looked different from the 14th floor. 
Alvarez not only moves between mediums with ease, but also between representational and non-objective modes. For the artist, abstraction is not a withdrawal from reality, but part of it, proof of perception, part of what she saw in her life on the 14th floor. Vertical life afforded a different perspective on reality. It became what the artist called her Mambo Mountain, that things could also translate, that um, called her Mambo Mountain, that could also translate into actual mountains on the island of Puerto Rico as well as things imagined. This idea of the vertiginous also fits comfortably with the trope of air travel that has been attached to Puerto Rico for decades beginning with significant Puerto Rican migration to the U.S. in the 1940s, writers, singers, and scholars have spoken of being up in the air, traveling on the airbus or over the air bridge that connects the two locales. A similar spatial temporal matrix is signaled by, life, by the life and vision of Candida Alvarez and which he found in her high rise. In an intersection with African diaspora theory, there's also the invocation of the transoceanic in the regular cruzando el charco, crossing the pond between the island and the colonial mainland. And um, <coughs> just this semester teaching a course on Latinx artists, it's called Latinx, Latinx artists coast to coast, which deals with Chicanx artists and artists from the Caribbean diaspora like Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican American artists, uh, Cuban American artists, so on, Dominican American artists on the East Coast. One of the major differences, and having just taught this, I've been teaching Latin America for many years, but to, I said, I got so interested, I said, let's just cut it off and do a Latinx course that's a seminar for undergraduates. And what I realized in delving into a lot of this literature is that one of the main differences between the Chicano artists or the Chicanx artists on the West Coast and the East Coast is that the African diaspora is so much a part of how people talk about the traditions of Puerto Rico, of Cuba, of Dominican Republic, that is so very different. And so, you know, when I had written about this, oh, this is in conversation with the African diaspora, and now teaching this course this semester, well, of course it is, because that body of literature, actually, the kind of more sociological literature, and even the artist literature uh, beyond Candida Alvarez is really um, talks a lot about this kind of, uh, at least Puerto Ricans, well, specifically Puerto Ricans in one sense, talk about uh, you know, kind of this Afro-Taino uh, aesthetic, which we can get into that later about the Tainos on today, Indigenous Peoples Day. But um, it's not, what I really want to say, it's not really surprising that um, in many ways that uh, Puerto Rican artists' works are in, in conversation with African diaspora. <coughs> Things found easily accessible, non-heroic, and unmonumental undergird Alvarez's practice and seem to seek her out. Some of these mundane art Items are physical materials such as fabric or bits of plastic. Some are fragments of popular imagery or are simply figures, which, as the artist notes, have been mashed up and shredded into space. Examples of this can be found in paintings like Chill, 2011, and Arroz Amargo of 2010, which are both on the screen, where imagery of the Jackson Five and Josephine Baker float, barely discernible on the canvas plane. And I know where they are, but I can't tell you or else I will be killed. So <laughs> the artist will come here, I told you don't say that. So um, anyway, but she, the point is that she's hiding these, there are figures in there, but they're really undiscernible. So like just kind of a, a, a later um, extrapolation of what Murray does. You know, Here we see even further abstracted in terms of bodies. One is first struck by intense and saturated color. In chill, an almost blinding white frames turquoise and snatches of marigold and poppy. Incandes incandescent citrus tones and edgy pencil lines merge in arroz amargo. The mixture of oil, acrylic, 
acrylic and enamel gives their surfaces an otherworldly slickness. As Alvarez puts it, and I quote, I always begin with something that finds me. Usually it has lived with me for many years before I pay attention. Sometimes it is more immediate. My state of making can be somewhat unpredictable. I don't rely on the personal, but on the longing to find companionship in materials. I like discovering relationships through serendipity or through the process of excavation that happens in the studio. All things matter, and at the end of the day, all things become part of that Mambo Mountain. Thank you. So, um, questions or, or no questions or, <laughs> I see a question all the way over there. Is there a sociological reason why so many of those artists were working in sculpture? No, but um, you know, there's more women working in sculpture than you think. You know, uh, again, this is part of art history. Like, oops, gee, that seems new. Oh, why? Because it hasn't been taught. You know, um, there was a show, and speaking of that, I can go to my my in, my trick slides that I have, and I can go back to that other one. Speaking of sculpture. Here's my latest obsession project that I was telling Professor Florman about, which is Augusta Savage. I just finished writing an essay uh, on her work. She was an artist who was part of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, no, not a lot of work left. Um, kind of almost uh, like Zora Neale Hurston, she's like a, really a contemporary. They're both from Florida. They die around the same time. But um, it, she, there was a show recently of her work, and I think it's still traveling. I think it's called Augusta Savage Renaissance Woman. It's still traveling. You can maybe check it out. And because there's not a lot of work, um, they paired her with people. She was a, a master teacher also. Um, so they paired her with some of her contemporaries, like Augusta Savage and her circle. And, and what you'll see is actually quite a few women sculptors in that circle. Selma Burke is one of them, uh, who purportedly made the prototype for the image of FDR and the dime. And uh, I think she's even from Ohio, if I'm not mistaken, maybe. Um, <coughs> but anyway, some amazing sculpture that I had never seen by Selma Burke, and a lot of it nudes. Um, which are a no-no, as I, I just said. So uh, I started out this uh, writing about her, uh, Augusta Savage, thinking about labor, because many of these women, um, you know, thinking again about migration, I'm still in that mindset from my book, South of Pico, and um, women, you know, up until 1960, the, the most easiest job for a black woman to get was as a domestic. And these women, you know, artists do all sorts of things to support their art habit. And these women worked as nannies and did people's laundry and all that stuff. So I wanted to think about the work in conversation with those kind of uh, ideas of labor. And I gave this paper to some people. And they were like, yeah, that's cool. But you should do a book on her. She's really cool and wow. And so I went into a whole other area, which is thinking about um, her dialogue with queer Harlem Renaissance, which uh, we think about a queer Renaissance in a literature, certainly in African American um, uh, studies, right? We think of Langston Hughes and County Cullen and these people who were, were queer artists, Gladys Bentley, if you've ever heard of her. And, um, but we haven't done it in art history, really. And um, there's a book that only came out uh, maybe five years ago or more on Richmond Barté, who's another sculptor of the period, sculptor, sculptor of the period. And um, it was written by a colleague of mine named Margaret Vondries. And she's the first person to be, and she had, you know, 
in some ways problems because she talked about him as being a queer black artist in the 20s and 30s. And people were like, what? Can you really say that about? Like, we've already said it about the writers. Give me a break, people. Um, so, you know, um, I'm not saying she's queer, but she's in dialogue with that moment. Um, because as Henry Louis Gates tells us, you know, the Harlem Renaissance was, um, it was about the, the blackness, but it was about queerness, and it was not necessarily just either of those, right? Both of those things came in, and I think it's an early way that we can start thinking about, again, for me, and this is new for me, I, you know, there's plenty of scholars who've done great work with queer theory and queer history, um, but it gives us another angle onto the work. What are the things we are missing if we're not thinking about these ideas? What are the stories, just like, what are the stories we can tell our, about art history if we're not thinking about women and women as sculptors, gee. Um, you know, what are we missing? You know, so this was another thing. So I got really excited by it and her, um, she's a, she was really impressive that, that people look at this work. You know, this, this is, I don't even, I haven't even seen this piece. I don't even know if it still exists. You know, this kind of mythological creature here. Um, but they look at the work and you're like, oh, she's doing this in the 20s and 30s? Yuck. I'm not looking at this because we want to think about, you know, Matisse. We want to think about Brancusi. <laughs> we want to think about those kind of ideas of modern sculpture in a certain way, right? And there are African American artists making work in, you know, in dialogue with mostly painters in dialogue with modern, you know, this kind of idea of modernism, European modernism, like Hale Woodruff, for instance. Um, but and she spends time in Europe, you know, um, but she gets something else out of it, right? And I've been really fascinated about thinking about it because I think part of the reason why she's kind of cast aside and, and some of the, you know, looking back at some of these early articles that I've read about her for years because I teach her all the time, um, they're really misogynistic. You look again and you say, wait a minute, hold on, you can't say that. Um, so it's just to revisit something that's hiding in plain sight, right? You thought you knew what this was. You look at it, you say, wow, this is really weird. Uh, for 19, you know, 34 or whenever, you're like, ugh, put it away. Uh, she's a great teacher, and then you move on. But you, you look further into it, and you see some other things going on. Yeah, so the question is, because I'm repeating the question for the video, um, what are the dialogues that these artists, Catlett, um, Murray, and um, Alvarez may have had or may have with uh, kind of queer histories? And I, you know, I don't know 
what that is, but I can say in the case of, of Catlett, for instance, the gallery where she has her first show, Barnett Aiden, is um, queer, you know, in DC. Uh, she's studying at Howard, okay, it's pretty queer. <laughs> Elaine Locke is there. <laughs> Other people are there, uh, you know, talking about Harlem Renaissance queerness. Um, and these guys um, who start that gallery are, are, are queer. So it's not, that's just a fact, and I don't know where it goes, but certainly to say that you know, there's, a, there's obviously some interchange. How does it impact the work? I don't know. I think, you know, I wrote this Catlett piece already. I've just written this one piece about um, Augusta Savage that isn't yet edited or published. <laughs> so, but what I realized in, because it does turn on her um, focus on the nude and the role of the nude, because the nude has been so suppressed in, African American art history, and myself included, as you saw, you know, there's a problem with the nude in African American art history. Black artists don't want to show the nude body. But in fact, what I what I found in looking back here is that it's actually much more suppressed than anything else. And what I think now about these catlet works, you know, if I go back, there's a reason why, or let's go to there she is, why there's the bodies. It's a way of veiling the body, but it's also a way of doing the body, too. So it's not just about veiling, and it may not be about what Michael Brinson says. Oh, she's, she's pushing back against all the vices. She may be talking to the vices. And I didn't ask her, so I don't know. But there's another way of, of thinking about that. So um, I think you're absolutely right, and you know, passing the torch to anybody in this room who wants to, wants to work on it, you know? Um, one thing I will just say about, here's my other trick slide that I have, is that one thing that I will tell you that's not a secret that Candy Alvarez told me was <laughs> that this piece, her other name for it is Vitruvian Woman, right? Because here you go, we got Leonardo, and guess what we see? That triangle there in the middle! Um, and you know, the relationship between these. So um, again, it's just a shape, and I'm not saying, oh my God, you know, all this work is feminist, it's about genitalia of the 70s, but they're having fun. You know, they're like, ha ha, I'm gonna put this triangle in, ha 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 ha, this is hilarious. This is about, I mean, he's nude, he's showing his stuff, I'm gonna pretend to do it too. So um, I, I think the, the idea of having fun and not being afraid to, to think about these things is just as important. Other questions? Yes. Uh, this is for your talk, and, um, and I, you know, I've read the video a few pages, the historical, but also the sort of context, but also the, you know, the incredible readings that you have of the I think that's a great question, which is when do we name women's artwork as feminist work? Um, I, you know, and I, and I understand women, particularly women of a certain generation. I think now you can, you know, you can think about somebody like a Simone Lee, and would she say her work is feminist? Maybe. I mean, she did a whole, you know, performative thing on, on women, so, so yes. Um, but also pro people have problems with that word sometimes. I don't know. I don't think it's a bad thing to bring up. Why not, you know? Um, and as art historians, we don't only limit ourselves to what artists say about their own work. 
right? Especially for those of you who have the luxury of talking about people who are no longer alive most of the time. You don't have to ask them. I mean, you may look at what people of their time said, what they even said back in their time, but we don't have to be limited to that. We can say that. They may not agree. Um, if you're going to publish a work in their monograph, <laughs> you may have a problem doing it. But um, I think we should leave that open, but, um, but also talk about these things, right? I, I don't, you know, this is my take on it. What's your take on it? What's the artist's take on it? You know, but if you're going to tell me this is Vitruvian woman, I think there's something, there is a commentary going on there that I would label as feminist. Okay, one more question, and then we can close it down. Yes, yes, you, sir. Asp is feminist art aspirational? Hmm. I don't think so. I think there was a moment in the 70s when it well, maybe you could call it that. I mean, people didn't think they were aspiring. They th actually thought they were making it <laughs> feminist. You know, women's house and stuff in, on the West Coast. Uh, then I think what happens in the, in the history of feminist art from my reading of it is that people don't want to be boxed in, just like people you know, sometimes don't want to be an African-American artist. They just want to be an artist. Um, but I think that um, if people are working with different histories, um, we have the right to talk about it. Um, I, I don't know if it's only aspirational. I think people, sometimes people take it on um, because, well, if you want to think of feminism as aspirational because we're not there yet, yes. <laughs> you know, a progressive uh, place in the world where we want to think about equality and we want to think about, um, you know, equality on many levels, um, pay, um, education, um, labor, all sorts of things. Yes, it is, feminism can be aspirational because we're not there yet. But <laughs> um, I think there are people who still would talk about their work as, as feminist as well. So, thank you all so much for your time. <laughs>